I am an architect, I usually say, but I'm over it now, really. Uh, <laughs> I'm not always sure that the training of architects is, 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 is quite what it ought to be, and I, I can say that because I, I, I did train architects for a while. Um, so I'm a recovering architect. And what I'm going to be talking about this evening is probably more to do with urban design than architecture. We'll talk about both. Uh, but I, I, I become more and more convinced that urban design matters much more. Um, so uh, let's press on. I've got far too many slides, so I'm going to go very quickly um, uh, in the hope that we might go back and rejoin some of the ideas and themes if you want to at the end in, in questions. Um, so that's the title I, I chose. I'm not going to... I, I, might, I might disappoint some of you. I mean, I'd love to talk about some of my other uh, passions, like the work of uh, Carlo Scarpa, the Italian architect who did wonderful poetic things with old buildings um, and bring those to life, or, or, or um, Carlo Di Carlo, uh, his work in Urbino. But I, that misses the point, I think. What I'm, what I'm trying to do this evening is talk about techniques or processes which you, as a town, might latch on to. Um, Architecture is really difficult. Um, it's difficult enough when you've got a good client and a good architect and, and, and just a private project to do. But I'm going to be talking about and looking at some projects which are really public projects. It's new housing, basically, and new, new parts of, of, of settlements. Um, and they are fraught. <laughs> They're fraught because of all sorts of reasons. Um, there's no real client. Um, there's uh, always problems with, with money in different ways, we might revisit those. Um, but the way in which they're financed and invested in is, is a particular problem in this country, in the UK. So we need to find ways around that, unfortunately. And there's a planning system. And I support the planning system, but it is a, a bugger, really. <laughs> it does need sorting out. Um, and successive governments have attempted that and not really... Well, the outcomes have never changed, really, so um, we can you know, have a debate about whether it's been good or bad. So, that's a brief overview of, 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 of what I want to cover tonight. I'm going to start off with some generalities before we look at the examples which, which Rex mentioned. So, um, I, I've stolen these great masters, um, Constable and... Uh, who's that? That's the uh, Northerner, isn't it? Um, <laughs> thank you. I, I do enjoy um, audience participation, especially when I forget <laughs> the names. Um, anyway, we, we're told by statisticians that 51% of us live in a rural bliss over here, and 49% of us, 9 of us live in uh, the satanic mills of urbanism, right? And we have this really weird way of dividing the world into these two places. And I, you know, but actually, what I see more and more is that emerging, which has none of the qualities of either. Um, I think here in St Ives you've got this wonderfully dense, tight, inner um, piece of urban life, and you've got the wonderful countryside on the edge, and that's the way it should be. It's the mush which we are offered, <laughs> uh, without doubt, um, which, which, which really ticks no boxes. Now, Hands up those who think that design is subjective. Can I ask you to do a little survey? Very enlightened audience. <laughs> well, I think it's a bit, bit of a hard question, isn't it, really? Because obviously contrary is, is it objective? No, OK, yeah. yeah so if we agree it's a bit of a mix, yeah. Yeah. who would say it's more than 50% subjective? Brave man, good, good for you. <laughs> Everyone else guessed it was a loaded question, or at least <laughs> were kind to me because they know I'm going to try and prove it otherwise. And I wanted to prove it otherwise by, by not looking at a building or a town, but looking at a bench. And this is one of my favourite benches. It's, um, it's an old one. Um, you've probably seen one or sat on one of these. Uh, the Great Western Railway, you see the GWR mono monogram there, um, designed these way back in the uh, late 19th century and it's a fantastic design. Um, let me point out some of the reasons why I think it is. It's made of only two materials, these planks of wood which is uh, where the body 
contacts the bench, so it's warm on a chilly morning, you know, it's not cold steel. Um, and there's also some timber here as plates so that these metal pieces don't uh, grind the, uh, the pavement when they move it around. Um, but you see there's just three identical castings which make a bench, so it's really economic to produce. Um, other little subtleties is, you see there's a little curve, which is the shape of most people's posterior, I think. And then there's a gentle curve on the back. So it's very generous and, and uh, good for the posture. The other thing I've noticed, having become interested in this, this design icon, um, is that the length of it is just perfect. Um, you know, there's always this awkwardness about sharing a bench, isn't there, with strangers. And you, you yourselves have a look when you're next on a Great Western Railway Station because that's the other testimony. These are still around, so they've proven that they are good design. But, but, but people occupy these in all sorts of creative ways. So, I'm encouraged. But this is Darwin in reverse. You know, evolution's supposed to improve things, you know, species. Um, well, unfortunately, this is what happened to this bench. Um, it's still the same bench. This is the first iteration. But look, the elegant monogram, which, which was actually lightening the casting, you see, because it was hollow, you see it pierced, yeah, has now been replaced by this British Railways Western Region uh, 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 icon. And... Um, so that, that, that's become much less elegant, I think I, I think I would agree. But then this is what really happened once British Rail started to rationalise how it was going to do benches. We've still got similar materials, look. But now we're welding frames to make the supports. And we've got these very clunky bits of mild steel, I guess, painted. And what that does is take out that gentle curve there and the gentle curve at the back, yeah? So the, the manufacturing process has actually weakened the design. And then I saw this at Western Supermare. This is now the privatised railway system. <laughs> and they must have said to some chaps, you know, go and make another one. And uh, this is what we got. And of course the, the gaps now are perfect for attracting chewing gum or litter to, to collect between them all sense of any elegance is gone. Look at the proportions of the damn thing. Um, and, and that's where, it, where it's gone. Now, okay, it's a, a bench is a bench, but um, I think one can discuss design in those sorts of ways before we get purely onto the aesthetics. I did go onto the aesthetics at the end there, you noticed. But um, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can discuss objectively before we can quite rightly, move to something subjective. But then we recognise it as being subjective and we have ways of dealing with that. So that's one of the reasons why Design Review, which uh, Rex mentioned I'm the chair of in, in Cornwall, is such a good process because it's through that debate and dialogue that we can edit out the things which, OK, you're, it's your building, you, you, know, you, you have an opinion about that, we're not interested in that. But this is really important, this, this part of the design, we can come to some rational conclusions about and we think you've got it wrong, you need to revisit that. So that's the way that sort of works. But of course, um, places are much more complex than objects like a bench. Um, Christian Norberg Schultz gave a very quick formula for what makes a place. It has to have a particular identity and then it has to have enclosure. A place is a place, you know, it, it, it is located somewhere. So that sense of enclosure uh, is useful. Um, I, I then courageously tried to expand that some more, and I won't go into it now, but um, I think that, to portray it in another way, um, there's these ways in which place is affected. The thing which I'm going to go on to talk about at more length now is connectivity. Well, I'm going to talk about other points of this. But, you know, what happens in a place really matters, where other places you can get to from any place, it really matters. Look at London and the house prices rocketing it up now. It's because it's so brilliantly connected. Bounded form, you do need actually to fashion a place. And then signification, you know, the, actual, the actual marking of a place to make it memorable and give it an identity. 
And so these things all interact with one another. Yeah. And, and we get this thing which we recognise, a very useful term called place. Um, this is a very favourite quote of mine. Richard Letherby was born in Barnstable in the southwest. Um, one of the real, really serious writers about civic design, architecture, urban design. And if you can ever get a hold of this book, it's, it's a terrific read. This is just a short quote from it. Towns and civilization are two words for nearly one thing. The city is the manifestation of the spirit of its population and the larger body it builds for its soul. Um, and he goes on to say something very Churchillian, like, you know, uh, Churchill said, we fashion the built environment, then the built environment fashions us. So um, I think that's very interesting. I mean, if, if, if places do really have spirits, we, have, we talk about genius loci, the spirit of the place, um, then it probably does reside in the public realm. I was just enjoying walking through your beautiful town this evening. And it's the joy of walking through these different bits of street and alleyway and footpath, which is really the delight of St Ives. Any one building you could take out or put back and it wouldn't change the experience that much. It's the actual route and the, the encountering of these urban spaces. That wonderful image on the right is where they think the, um, I think it's the Aztec uh, civilization uh, originated from. It's in Mexico somewhere. Um, and uh, it was later taken over by the Spanish and you can see the, the ancient sort of pattern which is this radial form. Uh, everyone needed a boat because it's an island. Uh, I guess fish was high, high up the diet. Um, so they had a... <coughs> uh, but then the, the Spanish came and put this Western European rational grid on it. Um, which sort of works, it's interesting. Um, and right in the middle, a tiny, tiny square with a public building. There's just one church, I think, or a, 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 the governance building or something like that. So even here, where land is so precious, there's a bit of public realm given over for everyone to share. You know, I think this really gets close to the fundamentals of what being a human being is, and cooperating and exchanging ideas and, and social exchange, and we need that, we need that, and that's what I'm afraid people like Persimmon, Taylor Wimpy, do not understand. <laughs> it's all about what is your possession, what, what, is, what are you going to buy, you know, what, what is that property, and what is it worth, and then the rest of it is, is actually expense, we don't want to go there. So, um, sorry, that's a bit cheeky of me, we'll go into that a bit more depth later. But what's absolutely stunning about this place, I mean, it's so powerful anyway, but it's, it's, it's amazing that when the river gets the rainy season, it becomes a, a little Venice. And all these lanes and, and trackways become, become canals. I would love to go there, and I hope that just out of shot there isn't some sort of holiday inn with, full of American tourists, but I, I suspect there may be. I've spoken too long for that, I'm not going quick enough, but you see here is your town. And I think the counterpoint to what I've just said about being able to talk about design rationally and objectively is that actually a place is a work of art. It's evolved into this form over centuries, hasn't it? And with lots of incremental bits and bobs just being added, just shifting all sorts of history playing out in every little tiny decision and really to make that again would be impossible if it got obliterated. That's when I look at these uh, terrible scenes from the Middle East I mean goodness knows the human suffering but there's part of me which is just as terrified that the place has been raised. All those centuries even millennia of accumulated human endeavour and I think when you lose something of that sort, it's bound to have something to say about your psyche if they ever try to rebuild. So um, I think there is, at the other end of the spectrum, just a sort of mystery about human inhabitation, which again, um, unfortunately for various reasons, contemporary development misses. <coughs> In my work for the Architecture Centre, I do lots of uh, collaboration with different 
enablers, we call them. One of them is lovely Sue McGlynn. So I, I, you know, I'm stealing her slides. Sorry, Sue, if you're watching. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but she does really uh, talk about places in, in a very informed way. And she moves from the macro sort of ideas down through and comes down to building elements and materials. So it goes from the, the context to the detail. And quite often when we talk about the character of a place, what makes it distinct, there's far too much fiddling about down here. And the re all the big stuff is forgotten. Um, you know, so down here in Cornwall, we do love granite, we do love delible slate. That's quite right. But that isn't the end of the story when we're talking about, in fact, it's not even part of the story. Um, so um, Sue is very quick to point out, we need to start right at the top of that and work down. Um, and starting with, with landscape is, is, is really the, the first place. Um, most, most existing settlements are built exactly in the right place. That's why it was slightly bonkers a few years ago when, remember, there was the Eco Town um, uh, program. And the government at the time thought that there were some bits of land sitting around which would make great places to live which had never been found before. Um, and, and, and you think about Cornwall and all the old places are in exactly the right place for where they ought to be. They're either at river crossings, I live in Lost Withiel, the, the tidal reach of the Foy, so it was the first bridge over. Um, well, there's lots of port towns, aren't there? And then there are sort of hilltop towns, there's the Liscards and the Launstons, which are obviously grown up around castles. And this, this story of why a place is where it is has to be the starting point of any design in my book. Um, and of course, when you start to then map the contours and the, and the flows of rivers, etc., things fall into place. I'm afraid to say that the planning system doesn't think in this way. <laughs> it's, it's kind of an abstract, well, uh, we need another 5,000 houses, where's the nearest land? Oh, well, it's on the edge of the floodplain, never mind, we'll, we'll make it work. And, and, and so the, there's a sort of um, bureaucracy which... which misses the poetry of places and, and, the, and, and the real raison d'etre. This is another very powerful slide. I'm still on Sue McGlynn's uh, uh, work here, but it is wonderful. Here is um, somewhere in Italy, um, and that is a Roman road, of course. 2,000 plus years old. All the buildings, youngsters, maybe only 500, 600 years old perhaps much more modern than that. So the thing which has persisted is actually the route, the public space. So you get the public space network right first if you're designing a town well, then you subdivide it into plots which are developable and then you start thinking about the buildings. And if you've got this wrong, you know, don't worry about the buildings, it's not, it's not going to be a great place. <laughs> um, Interestingly enough, when, when the fire of London occurred, uh, Christopher Wren, you may know this, wanted to build a renaissance plan, a new great master plan. But even in those days, all the lawyers came out and said, <laughs> in the piles of ash, uh, I believe my client's got an interest under, under here. You know. so, so this, these legal boundaries, which is what we're talking about, the difference between public and private ownership, that's what persists. It's the legal framework actually becoming a spatial framework. Um, and those streets relate obviously to movement. Um, and this is a, the sort of diagram which uh, uh, a system called Space Syntax de delivers. And it's a kind of computer driven thing, but it's, it's amazing what it can tell you. And so it moves some hot streets, this is Oxford by the way, move some hot streets, which are the red ones, through the uh, medium streets to the cooler blue ones. And it's all to do with how many other streets connect to that. So it's, it, it produces a hierarchy. And guess what? All the business and commerce happens along the hot streets. So you can see immediately there's a, there's a use for this in terms of retail location, for instance. Um, they've also used it uh, for things like uh, predicting where crime will occur. 
Um, and despite all, all rumours to the contrary, cul de slacks are brilliant for crooks because they can always get round the back gardens, you see, and, and get in over the back. Yeah. There was a, a scurrilous attempt to disprove that, but it's all because, you know, there's lots of minor crimes which are reported in a high street, for instance, and so it skews the figures. But if you're worried about burglary, if you're worried about your house being entered and your, 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 your goodies stolen, then don't live in a cul de sac. In general terms, obviously. Um, Jan Gale uh, also talks very profoundly about public space, and I like this diagram on the right. Um, he sort of says that if you've got to go out and get a pint of milk, then it doesn't really matter whether you've got a, a, a very poor environment or, or a good one. You'll go and make that journey because you need the pint of milk for your cornflakes. However, if it comes to optional activities like um, going and have a coffee in an Italian square, you'd only do that if it's, if it's a nice place. You're not going to sit on the corner of the street and have a coffee. Well, maybe some of us do, <laughs> out of desperation. But, um, but you know, that really affects whether, whether you make that decision or not. And then, I really like this, it's resultant activities. Um, winking at nuns, for instance. You know. it's, it's, those, it's those casual exchanges, those, those interactions which are unexpected, not premeditated, which, which uh, are the things to really to watch out for, really. That, that, that's, the, that's the proof of whether you're getting it right. Another collaborator uh, is Hugh Barton, who's done so much work up at UWE, University of West of England, about the best place to put the centres of, of neighbourhoods. I won't dwell on this, but uh, you can see the, the diagrams there. Um, and when you start to look at historic towns, it's so evident where the, uh, well, Tree Maddock, for instance, where the pub is. It's on that corner. It's the best pitch. Um, you know, you, you, can, you can almost predict where things are. And notice also where the church goes or, or doesn't go in some situations. And here, I think these are two Yorkshire towns where there's clearly a typology starting to emerge about how they make towns in that. So there's a culture of towns as well. You can see why I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in urbanism. I apologise to those architects uh, who are hoping for more on that side. But this is the antithesis. I'm not actually sure whether this is a real photograph or it's been photoshopped, but there are places like this um, out there in, in, in Australia and America, especially, and, and Mexico as well, where, where all those things I've been talking about, which makes a good place, disappear. And this, unfortunately, is exactly the investment model which, which attracts um, developers. Because that's the real estate, you know exactly what it's going to cost to produce, you know exactly what it's going to fetch on the market, therefore they'll put some money up front to get the thing constructed. So this fits the investment model, unfortunately, and the planning system has therefore been invented in a way, or become... Subservient. Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's the, this is the challenge which it's got to turn around. Planning didn't start there because it, it was all about the sort of rational arrangement of functions, and there is still some of that in it, the sp spatial planning. But I, I feel more and more that planning is, is about much more detailed issues um, for it to be, a, well, the success which we'd all hope it to be. <clears throat> okay, here's, here's, here's an attempt. Uh, this is the first example, very short one. Uh, this is Tides Reach at um, uh, opposite Tynmouth, um, Sheldon. Um, and this is the River Teen here, bridge over the river here. And you can see it's quite, quite well organised. There's, there's a frontage fronting the river and then near the main street. And then what's special about it is this space in the middle where um, very usefully they've, they've created a, a, a public space. And this is a view of the interior of that space. Really good quality detailing of, of floorscape. You see the floorscape changes from larger patterns where it relates to the road and then goes into smaller patterns where you get to pedestrian ways. It's another area where character is often forgotten. Again, developers build the house and almost sometimes leave it entirely at the discretion of the purchaser what the curtilage is like. 
But you go to, many of your buildings in St Ives are right bang back of pavement. So I, I can't really um, say this is necessarily uh, something to apply to you. But the character of a neighbourhood is quite often formed by what, what happens at that join between the public and private. And if you've got good quality detailing there, it lifts the whole place up dramatically. This is a, a, a project, so that was just really making sure that urban design is actually invested in the project, not just architecture. And here, um, I had quite a lot to do with this project in, in Totnes. Those of you who know Totnes, the town centre is north of here. This is the end of the high street, really. Um, there's a little space at the top of the town there, and then it, it feeds off here. So we had sort of medieval buildings, all their replacements, coming up to here, and it comes up past the Kingsbridge Inn. Does anyone know that, perhaps? No. Anyway, um, Southam's council had a long, long discussion and... I might even call it a battle with local people about what should happen with this big area here. Um, it's car parks and it's what makes Totnes work. Everyone comes here, parks their car, and migrates onto the high street. And so lots of difficult issues to deal with if they were going to remove any spaces. But then the people of the town also wanted it to be greened and, and all that. So anyway, the... the um, the good news was that Southampton owned the land, and land ownership is another crucial factor in creating quality places, uh, because you don't then have to rely entirely on planning regulations and rules. Anyway, what they decided to do was to not develop the whole thing because that, that wouldn't, go, wouldn't wash with the retailers, but to mend this bit of the town here, imagine that without any buildings on it or that without any building. You came here and then there's this sort of sea of cars. It was not a great arrival point. Um, and then down at the bottom here to extend this terrace and then put some new market housing there. The other thing which South Hams were desperate to do, because I guess it's very much the same as St Ives, um, was to produce lots of affordable homes because they, they, they can never get enough, frankly. Um, so what they did, acting in good developer fashion, was to produce some high, high value, quality terrace homes here, townhouses, and then most of this, uh, well, this is a mixture, but, but a lot, a high proportion, I think it's 50% affordable homes. So there is a local authority using its assets really wisely um, to deliver on affordable housing, yes? Um, not all local authorities act with that wisdom um, and property departments are another serious worry at this, you know, in, in contemporary life here. They're supposed to get best value for in disposing assets and they, something like this represents to me best value. But if they'd have sold those sites to a developer, they could have got lots of money. So s the interpretation of what best value is really needs to be pressed. Um, but they did own the sites and, and, were, and, the, and the active members, because of all that pressure from the community, said, look, we've got to do this. Now, the unusual thing they did here was that they didn't simply get an outline permission to establish the quantums of development, but they went all the way and got a detailed permission. That's the local authority itself, and then invited tenders from developers. So they knew exactly what they were going to get, but they just wanted to know what the deal was. Uh, which I've never heard of before. And I, in fact, when I first heard of it, I said, are you sure? <laughs> it seems like a lot of work and you might not get anybody interested at the end. But it did work. I mean, it worked particularly in Totnes because it's a very desirable place to live. But then St Ives is a very desirable place to live. So, um, again, it was a, a leap of faith and trust which the authority placed in its, in its officers to, to go that far. Um, and then this is uh, what was delivered. Uh, very green as well, that was the other thing. Some, these, these are very highly insulated and, and, and um, have other energy saving measures, renewables and all that. These are the four storey townhouses uh, down at the bottom of the site, that's the rear view. They also created some green open space which I forgot to tell you about. And then this was extending the terrace on the right, so you know, using colour to blend it in, but obviously going up in scale to get more, more development out of it, which I think works very, very nicely. 
Um, and this was an article I wrote about the process, uh, because along the way I had various roles. Uh, right in the beginning we, we, we played around with the counsellors with some plasticine models, um, just to uh, explore what, what, what the shape of the place might be. That top right is Anne Marsh, she was then a counsellor and the design champion for Southampton, so she had a large part to play in it all. Um, and then we went through a design review process uh, towards the end, when, once the schemes came forward, um, and I indeed helped Anne uh, convene a, a public art um, uh, group because there was some money set aside from the development to invest in, in that. So um, it was a good process, and uh, that's one of the corners as it, as it turns. And it won the 2009 Housing Design Awards Winner of Winner in the, uh, that's the national prize. Um, so that was you know, that's ordinary development, but it, we've achieved that. You know, it's not it's not going to win the the Pritzker Prize or the um, you know the Sterling Prize, but it's actually doing something with ordinary development, which is much much better than uh, usually appears. <coughs> I mentioned the Sterling Prize. This is Jim Sterling himself um, doing an exercise for Team Ten before he became brilliant and famous uh, and they set in the task of looking at this West Wickham in Buckinghamshire and say well okay if, you, if, if we wanted to extend it what would we do uh, and, and try and you know maintain a rural village character and this is an interesting point I think that it's kind of based on the structure the constructional technology and that is what most vernacular buildings are derived from. I mean you didn't get um, people in, in the 19th and earlier centuries doing things because it was interesting or whizzy or because they'd seen it on Kevin MacLeod you know. Um, they did it because it, it made the building rational and cheaper and better to build, simpler to put up. So Sterling is here is revisiting that sort of tectonic approach to architecture uh, and at the same time discovering all sorts of interesting ways to um, bring light in and, 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 and move the thing around on plan. And then you can assemble these buildings into, into streets, informal streets, villagey streets. This is going back into the 1960s, I think. Uh, but you would think what else was happening in the 1960s. And this, this was really quite radical in terms of an approach. And look, this is how that same section can work on slopey sites. So we don't have to dig a great hole in order to get this stupid flat footplate in or, or, or bring it out the side. So, so you know, it has lots of different advantages there. Well, it was just a project, never got built, but I think it certainly influenced Peter Aldington. This is his project uh, where he lives now um, in Haddenham. Again, going back now to the early 70s, I should think it would be. He bought the site with this stupid planning permission look. Three executive homes, yeah, and, and, the, and the road coming in, and then you go to your garages, look, like that. And you can immediately see, which way does that one face? Does it face that way back to the road? Does it face that way back to the, the, the main road? Or does it face this way, perhaps? I don't know. Um, so you know when you can't tell the front or back of a building that you're in trouble, it's not working. And what Peter did was say, well, we don't need to do that. It's wasteful, putting a building in the middle of a garden, you know, wasteful front garden, too small back garden. So he gathered them all around where the vehicles come in and was able to prove that he could make four houses of about the same size and they all had much larger back gardens. So that's where he got to. Um, oh, sorry, and he could save some trees on the site which were otherwise going to be knocked down. He's a very keen gardener. He's more interested in gardening than architecture, Peter. But uh, Anyway, so th then he realised once he got started, actually he wanted a big house for himself. <laughs> so he went back to three units, um, two units which he would sell to, 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 to pay for it, but then he could have an even bigger garden. And now you can visit this garden. It's, it's uh, I don't know what the national term is, but it's, it's now recognised as a really important garden. Um, and finally, over here, he was able to keep the walnut tree, which was right on the front of the site. Um, and he's added more garden to it by buying bits of land. It's a great place to go and see if you can. And there's the walnut tree on the front of the site. 
So this is the way in for the cars. Wonderful. And it's all sort of subtle. No, no, nothing shouting. Very gentle. So Peter, controlling the whole site, was able to put together a building of very simple materials, but they speak of quality in a sort of rural, rustic sort of way. And keeping the lineage going, here now, I think, is um, a direct descendant, Richard Murphy, who is a great Scottish architect. Um, well, I know he's, he's English, but he lives in Edinburgh. <laughs> they were claiming for, his own, for their own, I'm sure. Um, but this is an interesting... Peter Aldington, was, as Sterling, was, was interested in breaking roofs like that, so getting light in through clerestories and things like this. And Richard Murphy is doing the same here. This is uh, a very interesting type because, again, you don't, you don't see this coming forward in conventional development these days, but he's produced almost a single aspect house. So there's the bathroom storage um, a void there, uh, and then these are high windows and the circulation there. So all the rooms look down the page, um, and it's usually south as well, which is helpful which means that you can put them together in a rather different way than you would expect uh, normal houses to go. And so here we have a layout. Uh, this is New Hall in, um, uh, in Harlow. And I'll tell you more about that. This is the way of getting into that. Um, so, so here, this building in fact provides a, a, an end of the garden wall to number 87 because this is looking this way. And so it goes. But what you get here is a wonderful, interesting grain. Now, if you think about some of those earlier images I showed you from, from the air, um, it, it, unless we develop the architecture at the same time as the urban layout, it just doesn't work. So you've got to be working with both at once. And um, I think that this is a really interesting development, which, uh, in terms of uh, a new typology, which might, might get used. Although I can't see the major house builders using it. But New Hall uh, is, is, is a really amazing example. I must talk to you about this. Um, Harlow, you probably know, is a new town. Um, so this is adding something new to something not very old at all. But at the same time, Harlow does have a really important town planning history. Uh, it was Frederick Gibbard who laid it out. Um, and you can see he's very carefully planning for the long term. These are all neighbourhoods. And this is New Hall and Church Langley, you can see there. Yet to be built, or, or now just coming forward. Um, OK, it's a bit sort of 1940s uh, and, and geeky, but it was planning, but for 50 years. Not, not, not for the maybe 20 years, once, well, 15 years once we get the planning place kind of thing now. Um, I mean, we, we, we just create problems for ourselves because we're not looking far enough ahead. We need some much more strategic planning which um, everyone accepts therefore. So they're placing the last two pieces of, 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 of Harlow together in this scheme. Now Harlow is not a great place. Um, you know, values are not as high as you might expect for somewhere which is in easy commuting distance of, 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 of London. Um, but here in New Hall um, there's an interesting situation because there are two brothers who are Dutch who owned the land. They were farming it. Um, they didn't really want to turn it into a housing estate but, uh, or neighbourhood, um, uh, but you know, it got allocated and that, therefore they, they, they were going to go with it. Um, but the first phase, well not the first phase as in drawn there, but the first bit of building was so appalling they said, what can we do? <laughs> we won't, don't want to be responsible for this as landowners. Um, and if only we had more patrons in that way. Uh, so often the landowner is just about disposing of the land and, and giving it, you know, the process goes away and, and they emigrate to Bermuda or somewhere and uh, buy a very big house. But these guys stay on site and they want to actually cultivate a good quality place which they can be proud of. Um, so they turned to Roger Evans, who is a fantastic urban designer and, and architect, um, and they appointed him as, as much more than, than a master planner, but he took charge of the whole process. 
I'll come back to talk about that at the end. But this is uh, now some slides from Roger Evans, and he said, this is an interesting thing which they asked themselves, why can't we build the places that we'd like to visit? So here, uh, you probably recognise that as... Uh, yes, well done. Um, there's the Royal Crescent. So the same scale, they just plopped. You know, what, what, what would Bath look like on this site? And what would... You probably won't get that one. Oxford look like on that site? Or well, what would Venice look like on that site? I mean, it's stupid, obviously. None of those would work. But just to see what the scale is relative, you know, what, why couldn't it suddenly emerge as something as wonderful as any of those three on this field? They ended up looking at these buildings in Cheltenham. I've forgotten quite what Roger says about them, but, but you may see a resemblance later. But this is another important point he makes. Places which attract people also attract investment. So when I get attacked, sometimes, that design is just you know, the icing on the cake, it's all frivolous like this, it's actually fundamental to whether a place prospers or not. Because if, it, if it's known to be lousy, um, then uh, people won't invest in it, and it's a vicious circle. Otherwise, you've got the virtuous circle. So th these are some of the things which uh, Roger established in setting the overall framework for what New Hall ought to be like. All the natural environments were respected, and that goes well beyond any AO, uh, you know, sites of scientific interest, etc. It's the real green infrastructure of the place. It's trees and things like that, and hedgerows. Developed remainder of land at higher densities, therefore, yeah, because you've given much more back to nature. So you've got to increase the densities there. Maximise the linkages. That's talking about those, those diagrams and movement, which I showed you. People on foot take priority over people in cars. Master plan built out with contemporary architecture. It's probably put in because it was a time when Prince Charles was particularly in the news. Um, set higher standards for sustainability than current regulations and implement using design, urban design guides, briefs and codes. So some very simple uh, basic rules. And it was to create a walkable neighbourhood. That's the sort of structure of the place in, in terms of nodes, gateways, landmarks, movement. So I'm going to go through these very quickly now. There, there's the first phase plotted on here uh, to give you some scale of it. There's the green infrastructure, new and existing. Some sizable bits of, of woodland and this is a stream which comes through here. Great assets, actually, really. Um, and here's the movement of people on foot, or the primary. I mean, people can obviously walk down streets, but these were particular routes. The, in the future, the retail heart, or the town centre, is going to be here. There's going to be a minor thing here. Well, there is now a minor thing here in, in, the, uh, in the first phase. So although the basic pattern is, is grid, it's a deformed grid because of nature, but then, as you get near to the town centre, diagonals appear so that people on foot can get quick to the, to the facilities they need. And then last, not first, is the road network, which, which makes the pattern up. And so here is uh, another look at phase one, with the, the warmer colours being the higher buildings, the more intense development, the general development, and then a lower density as it m makes its way to the edge of the site. This is, I really like these images which she's produced, where it's like, it's like a cornfield, you know, you're making crop circles. So, so you, you put the whole site up at, at two-storey or three-storey level, and then you start to cut the corn and, and leave places with the housing. I think it's a really different way of thinking about how development might be conceived. Um, anyway, uh, these are the different parcels of land which come forward. And that's one of the real, really key features, which I'm, I'm going to have to tell you more about in a minute. The main street th through the place has got a good scale to it, and um, a, a wide boulevard with, with trees. These are some of the sketches which, which Roger did. This is the very first, um, so the second phase, or parcel of land, uh, which is um, 
uh, a very famous bit of architecture now, won all the awards. Uh, sorry, and, and I should say is, is flexible vertically. So there's, there's, this, this can be turned into a separate apartment if you want to lodge it downstairs, or there's another way of, um, of, of having a, a du two duplexes. So it's a very flexible urban form which, which can transform over time. Some interesting Essex materials, thatch, which is a black timber, but used in a contemporary way. Oh, I've seen that before. What's going on? All right. Um, and this is a very radical bit of the scheme. Uh, this is just a, a visualisation. It's now built and looking much nicer with a copper, copper tower here. This is the end of the street. This is where we were jumping across the town centre. And this is a little um, a secondary square. That building now curves around like that to make a really nice place for sitting out. And there's cafes, shops underneath there. But this, this uh, tall building, which you saw an image of just now, presides as a landmark next to the open space there. So people can identify where the space is they're heading for by seeing the tower next to it. All, all very good stuff. And that's another view of that space. And, and what he did was use the design codes and the parceling of land so that from that space you get most contact with the most variety. So in a way it acts like signage. So if you're looking for that sort of style of, of parcel, you can see it from the, from the centre. So you don't need to say this way to X's place or this way. So, and, and also in, in public, I mean in high streets, we expect more variety, don't we, than in, in, in suburbs. So he's just replicating really a traditional pattern of how we might think to encounter things. So there's that building now which acts as the landmark. This looks like one picture, but it isn't. It's um, two spliced together. And then that, that's the shops and cafes with apartments above opposite it. I thought I'd put in this scheme, which is uh, up in Bude uh, in Cornwall. And that, too, uses a taller building on the, on the corner to m you know, mark out the space. And here is a, here is a public space opposite it. This sort of terminology which I'm using for those that are interested is sort of Kevin Lynch's way of thinking about cities and towns. Um, it would be a great thing for you to do in, in St Ives actually to try and identify on a map or Google Earth image where the nodes are, where are the edges, where are the paths, I mean the strong paths, obviously there's many paths, but are there districts which are clearly identified and, and where are the landmarks? How do you find your way around the place? Quite often very revealing. I won't draw on that. Right, the process. So, we know the land was identified for housing. That's where Roger Evans came in and, and produced this overall design framework and a design statement. The local authority adopted that, so that became part of the planning system. Then a master plan was produced with design codes attached. The design codes were both part of the planning apparatus, but they're getting part of the legal deal yeah so in selling parcels on there was a legal requirement to comply with the codes not just a planning requirement which is much more powerful and then detailed planning uh, consents were, were were secured but what happened here is they didn't release big plots, plots of land they released quite small parcels and each one was a developer design competition so roger evans oversaw the process of the competition and they, they negotiated with the, with the teams and finally chose, uh, making it very clear that they wanted good design, uh, not just a, a, a sort of offer for the land. Um, and so this place is, has grown and grown and e each um, development has added to the quality. And so it, it, it's, it's a way of actually cultivating higher land values. It may seem like a negative thing to do, but actually Somebody's got to pay for design at the end if it's, you know, if it's going to be really good. And so by actually accruing uh, value to this thing, then they could afford to do it um, in this way. There's some very interesting research by Yolanda Barnes of Savills, um, looking at Poundbury, uh, but two or three other sustainable neighbourhoods. And they identified that 
even though in the first period values would stay the same in terms of properties bought on that place, if it was a good quality place there was evidence to suggest that those places would get greater value after 25 years because people would really want to live there now. Um, but that's the irony of that is, is that developers don't get any benefit from that because they buy a piece of land, make the development, sell it off. And so what interest do they have in what it's going to be worth in 25 years? Maybe the purchasers would, but we only live in a house for seven years on average. On average. I mean, many of us more than that. But so, so that time scale is defeated. So you do need, it's another important message from this case study, you need like a, an interest in that development to be maybe a community interest company or something of that sort. You can see that value accrue at the end of the, end, end, end of the 25 years or so. This is an example of the very simple but very effective design codes. I won't go into that because Tom Porter, an artist, was, was commissioned to create um, a, 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 a material and colours palette. And he did that in a very beautiful way. So all, all schemes have to have some sort of relationship to this. So there's, there's plenty of flexibility, but at least they've got a framework within which to operate. So, just to explain the process one more time, here's Roger Evans and the, and the owner and all the other consultants they need. And they really drag in all the requirements from the planning authority, the services, the local community, and form this, and then let small parcels on a competitive basis to different development teams, emphasising that design quality is, is really important in being chosen at the end there. And here are some examples. This is the first, this is Barrett's, the first thing which, which made the Kern brothers go, ah, what can we do to sort this out? Um, we saw a bit, a bit more of, um, I wish, I, abode, that's it, uh, Proctor Matthews abode. Um, Roger himself did some rather plain housing on the other side. That's the main street going down, but it's good proportions. Here's uh, another image of that Richard Murphy scheme. Uh, this is looking at the back, the sort of back. This is just one uh, number of awards, Alison Brooks Architects. So each, each parcel, if I had a criticism, it's become a bit of an architectural zoo. Because, but, but what's happened is property prices and therefore land prices here are 41% higher than anywhere else in Harlow. So they can afford to pay for social housing. They can afford to pay for all that open space which we, you know, they wanted to preserve. So, so you know, we, have, we have to think financially if we want to actually uh, achieve all those public goods, the Commonwealth. Okay, I'm near, well, I'm getting close to the f final, but, but um, I was just thinking, what, what, what's the future going to hold? Well, we, we're, we're ba ba barely able to afford property these days, are we? I mean, you know, as a society, it's becoming more and more difficult. And I wonder if more collective living, like these almshouses represent, ought to be part of the way forward. I think it'd be very sad if we couldn't actually agree to cohabit in this way as a civilised society in this country. So I, I don't know, maybe that's one way forward. And a scheme which, which doesn't quite go that far, but um, this is a very green scheme up in Somerset, on the edge of Langport, right next to the River Parrot. I hope it's not underwater. Um, but two very rational terraces of housing. But the interesting thing is this bit, which because it was low-lying, it, it had to be open space, and they decided to make it a collective garden. And so they all join in and do the gardening here. And so in the middle of the site, you know, they, they all got some sort of ownership. The other interesting thing is that this paid for the refurbishment of that, which is a, a listed building. And that's become a training centre for, for green things and all that. Um, I haven't got time to explain. There's the, the garden which is in front of them. But very rational buildings. Um, you know, if you're going to be green, you probably do have to be quite rigorous. Um, there are romantic green architects around, but I think they're probably struggling. Um, okay, I think this is finally then. Um, 
had the great fortune to go to Freiburg in southern Germany, southwest Germany. Um, it's this kind of place. Um, there's, there's, um, it's a bit like St. Ives actually, um, except that they've got a university and it's a bit bigger. Um, but fantastic on many fronts and an incredibly green city, probably the greenest city in the world perhaps, I don't know. Um, and still relying on lots of traditional sorts of ideas like a massive market around the, the cathedral every day but at the weekends it just fills all the side streets as well so it's, and everyone uses it as the, as the place to buy food. It, you know, it's not dominated by supermarkets as this country. Anyway I went there with lots of people including Tom Flanagan who sadly isn't any, any more part of Cornwall Council but this gentleman was the public health director for the whole of the South West and what they, what he particularly realised was that the relationship between good planning, green architecture, green places and public health is fundamental. And if people do walk about more uh, then, and have, get exercise and have green spaces etc, then, then they're not going to be needing traditional health services. So he, he paid for us all to go over and, and see Freiburg. That was Janet Askew, who's, who's the current president of the RTPI, but was then up at UE as well. And they're taking a picture down to the cars, which are underground, quite, quite where they should be. There are two, two projects in particular which we went to see, Reiselfeld, which is a completely new neighbourhood, and then uh, Vauban, which you may have heard about, but is the, is the sort of uh, creme de la creme. Um, but this is the process which I want you to pick up from this one. It's about how they build it, how they develop it. Um, they need a master plan, but the master plan just establishes the basic building blocks of the place. Each one of these is then developed by perhaps six or seven, eight or nine mortgagees. So they have, apart from the planning system, they have a sort of matchmaking between presumably young people, but it might not be, who are coming together who want to have an apartment. And so they, 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 they forge them together into, into, into teams and then they enter into legal contracts with each other to become a sort of collective developer. The Baugruper it's called. And it's happening across a lot of southern Germany, not just Freiburg. And then they go out and hire an architect so they can get their own, you know, they become the client, the user becomes the client. Um, and then, the, as a normal way, they, they find a builder to build it. But they have to build it according to the rules and they have to negotiate with the people next door so they get the joins right. And then they all have some co-ownership of that middle space, which is usually a, a children's playground. Uh, but, but not always, or usually has some children's playground. Um, and then the cars go underneath and they occupy the space which is collectively owned underneath. Wonderful. Um, it works because they have a fantastic public transport system, which this slide uh, represents, but I, I, I haven't got time to sh show it. Oh, I must just show this though. Um, this is uh, the tram lines. Fantastic frequency. Uh, most of the time those black lines have a tram every seven to nine minutes and what these bubbles are doing are showing that the walking distance to a tram stop and it just about covers the whole city you can see there are pockets but it's fantastic and so it means that there's no point in having a car you know just just use the trams and walk or, or cycle of course which uh, many of them do it's absolutely fantastic uh, there's a there's another talk I could talk, give you about public transport but here in Reiselfeld, the new, uh, the new neighbourhood, they brought the tram in first. And they had trams running before anything else was built. So the first, first uh, occupant there knew that they could immediately rely on public transport. So you know, the infrastructure goes in first. Um, and then there's public buildings up here. Uh, and then you can see how the rest of the thing works. And there are no drains, well not for the, um, there are drains for the foul sewage, uh, but not, no drains for the rainwater. The whole thing is, is taken on as surface rills 
which again create wonderful little bits of eco habitat. Um, it's called a sub scheme in this well, country. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and the whole thing drains across to um, a sort of a wetland over here. While we're there, we, 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 we saw other things like the allotments, bottom right, with a fantastic old folks' home. What better relationship? I, I, I didn't, didn't think of this before I saw this, but if I was an old geezer up there, I'd just love to see people tending the gardens down below. It's a fantastic relationship. We ought to build more of those. Allotments and old folks' home go together. And here, look, using the side of an autobahn for, for solar collection, which seems like a better thing than building in fields. <coughs> I see lots of happening. Why can't we use the waste space? You know, it's a bit crazy that. Um, but again, it all works because of cross subsidies and things. The, the energy company um, cross subsidizes the public transport, and this diagram in German explains all of that. Um, but again, they've got the finances worked out. You know, it's not just le left of Southwest Water to fight with, uh, I don't know who it is, Schweb versus. Now they're, they're all protecting their own interests, but in Germany it's coordinated, so they can get those cost subsidies and they can make public transport affordable, etc. This is Vauban, or at least a little image of it, a different sort of pattern. Um, but again, in this country, all I see, particularly on the design review panel, is uh, single aspect apartments, which are not great. You know, you put a corridor down the middle of a block, and then you have apartments off that side, it's like living in a hotel, really which means no, no good natural ventilation, really, unless it's very carefully worked out. Um, but here, they all built double aspect. So each apartment, each level here, has got fronts and backs, and they can get air through. Um, but Vauban is really special, um, and they really hate cars. Uh, that car is illegally parked if it stays there for more than 15 minutes. You can, you can get there if you, if you need to drop off Granny or uh, the baby. Um, or drop off the shopping, but then you have to take it away and put it in, in one of these glass boxes, which is a, is, is a car storage. They don't call it a car park, they call it a car store, which is fantastic. And it's all secure and, and all that. But it means that these spaces, which is where people live, are so safe. Uh, and uh, I remember walking down this very street and I could hear about here the unmistakable noise of ping pong. I mean, I got to about there and looked sideways, and in a courtyard there were two, two lads playing ping pong. It, you know, but I heard it so far away. It wasn't normal in any sort of uh, usual urban context. It's fantastic. And what you get because of that bow grouper system is a great variety in the architecture. But because the master plan is, is, is established and, and, and establishes rules, some groups have to provide shops because otherwise no one would provide the shops so that's part of the deal if you want that block then you go there in fact what we're looking at here is not a bow grouper but some social uh, organization uh, developed some affordable homes here and, and actually they connect across these bridges so that they act as a, as a, as a team but you see the, the trams down the middle Cars can get down here. This is the main street, so that, that needs to have some, 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 some movement in it. Um, and I think this is my last slide. And, and naturally enough, it's attracted industries from the solar energy uh, area, etc., which, which, which are at the top of the street, because um, they want to be associated with this. And this, this picture here, I mean, I took it to remind me that there were several of us who about the same age who had kids and we all looked at each other at one point and said well, if only we had a, a neighborhood like this in which our kids could be brought up because it, it was just safe and perfect and in some way this sort of you can read that with the way in which those kids are just occupying that that bit of sidewalk it feels like um, they're meant to be there i've got plenty more to say but i'll stop there and let's see what your questions are